Hello, everybody. My name is Michelle. Um, so, so this is a sec section on capacity building. And I, I think it would probably help us to ask capacity building of what for what. And to declare some interest up front, we are, um, our program is funded by the IDRC. And our interest is in the development agenda very explicitly. So that really frames our perspective. We've been working for the last three years with universities whose logos are represented below. Our program is based at UCT, but we have been working with the universities of Mauritius, Namibia, and Botswana for the purpose of addressing the visibility of African research and beyond that, investigating how visibility of research can address the development agenda. So, one of the, the, maybe the definitional issues is we've been talking a fair amount this morning about the idea of scholarly communication. Just to make explicit what the definition of scholarly communication is that we're operating under, there's this um, definition from, from Thorin which we have found useful, particularly because it's expansive and it speaks to ideas and processes a broad range of outputs, and intrinsically ad addressing both relevance and prestige. That idea of the tension, or the, the walking that line between relevance and prestige, I'm going to come back to in a moment. But this definition, I think, is important to us in the thinking about communication of outputs to multiple audiences, because it really, position scholarly communication as central and intrinsic to the academic endeavor. It is not an add-on, it's not something you do at the end of a process. So I'm going to be touching on one or two things that Eve and Laura mentioned, on, mentioned this morning. We work very closely with the Open UCT initiative and our perspective is driven by the need that we see on the ground in the institutions that we're working with. So, the relationship between scholarly communication and impact um, is a very interesting one to consider in the developmental context. Um, we, in our study, did a value study in, amongst academics in our participating institutions because we thought there was an intrinsic relationship between the values that scholars and institutions held and the work that they did, and the kind of scholarly communication they were engaged with. And we saw that the institution's mission statements really encompassed the values of the academic communities that they, that, um, they spoke for. Uh, so a lot of the mission statements of our institutions now, the idea of development impact is right up there. It's right up front. The first line will say something along the lines of, addressing the socioeconomic challenges of our community, giving back to society, etc. And so we think that there's an interesting dynamic to be explored between values and impact. So what kinds of impact could we or should we expect from research? Um, the first of the items listed there, knowledge production, is, is the commonplace expectation. It's one that we speak about often, but there are others. Uh, research capacity building, particularly in the African context, very crucial. The idea of policy or product development and sector benefits. So Eve mentioned uh, the idea of informal business being able to get to research and research outputs, a really crucial issue for us in a developing context. And that speaks broadly to the societal benefits. Um, we're interested in the arguments behind open access that drive at productivity, innovation, job creation. Uh, this is an example particularly of, of an area where scholarly communication has been very active, is in the agricultural research sector in Africa. And activity in this area is spawning a lot of very interesting activity. Also, this is a, a, a piece from the, the Guardian in terms of speaking to how research can address better policy making and better governance of, of countries um, and at a con continental level. So 
basically, in our context, we have an argument that research needs to work harder in a developing context than it does in some, some other areas of the world. I want to say something about this for a moment because we have an international advisory board and we have uh, a lot of discussion about challenges in scholarly communication. And it's broadly acknowledged that all around the world economically things are tough. There are challenges in terms of information transfer everywhere. But we think there are some differences in the African context and some ways in which research needs to be responsive in a more efficient context. So if we think about what kinds of research do we want to put to work in our context, the short answer is all of them. This is a, an image which I think many of you are familiar with. It's a world mapper image, um, very out of date by now, but it hasn't, there hasn't been a, a more recent version. This is from 2001, and it represents African representation in the ISI indices. So going back to a point that was made this morning about how little research is being produced in Africa does not mean that the research is not taking place. Um, I'd like to share with you as an example of the wealth that we have. Uh, at uh, UCT recently there was the very big Carnegie 3 conference which was aimed at addressing poverty and inequality in Africa. And this was the list of the participating organizations. And I've included all of these slides to reinforce the idea, because each one of these about 170 entities are producing research on poverty and inequality. So we have an enormous wealth of content that's being generated within our institutions and within a number of African con countries that speak directly to the development context and that are aimed directly at driving at the important societal issues of our time. The question is really one of visibility and one of participation. So we have this mountain of what we're calling at the moment a, a mountain of content and the journal articles sit at the top of that. It is still, for all of our academics and all of our institutions, the principal commodity of exchange. Principal commodity by which you're going to be assessed both within your in institution and by your peers. But we're also seeing the, the very big rise in a number of other genres which are being exchanged. And what's interesting about thinking of, about these genres in the context of this mountain is that as you get to the base of the mountain, there is more and more of, the, of these <coughs> genre types, so the volume increases. But we also thought it was interesting to see how, as the volume increased, so did the potential development or societal benefit of some of those outputs. So the things that sit at the very broad, broad base, like the policy briefs and blog postings were often the kinds of scholarly outputs that were most useful to researchers in a non-academic context, people who are in parliament, people that were being expected to advise to government ministers, etc. So we also see the continuum into different kinds of social media and social networking on this continuum of expanding the reach of the kinds of scholarship that we produce. The challenge for us is that we are treating the mountain like an iceberg. And again, this was mentioned this morning, we are cancelling out and making invisible or not addressing the wealth of content that sits below this line. And what drives a lot of this what drives this approach in the institutional context that we've been working in are very complex and deep-rooted ideas around prestige. The question of how this serves the development agenda is not very well, is the short answer. 
So we know, and from working with academics in our partner sites, that we can't and we don't want to say to academics that you're not allowed to do one kind of research, you must focus on another. Um, that shouldn't, I think, be the case for academics anywhere in the world. So it really is about trying to find a balance for us between a way in which we can focus, have this trajectory of thinking about impact and having academics compete in their disciplinary networks amongst their global peers of producing a certain kind of work that speaks <coughs> to a prestige area, but also producing work and being recognized for work that speaks to relevance. So in this trajectory, the reward and incentives issue always emerges, naturally, as I think it's already come up this morning, as a mechanism within institutions that feeds this picture that we're looking at. And this is where we're seeing a fundamental breakdown in our context, in our institutions that the reward and incentive systems are serving a prestige agenda rather than a relevance mission. And there's something very complex going on here. It's been the subject of our research and we've um, done a lot of investigation with academics to try and unpick where this, um, this um, nexus rests. So what we can see is that we have a lot of academics introducing new kinds of scholarship with new audiences and um, as the point was made this morning, journal articles are not the only form of exchange. We're very interested in the open science model of scholarly communication. And some of you will know about the open science development, others maybe not. Open science is arguing for a very granular work in progress approach of sharing multiple kinds of outputs at different stages of that knowledge production cycle, which Laura showed this morning. And um, I love this, uh, there was a recent presentation um, on the future of scholarly communication and there was the idea of publishing systems that run as application <coughs> servers, which resonates really strongly for us in our context. The idea of a system, a space that can do multiple things for multiple different kinds of audiences at the same time. So, what Laura spoke this morning about the UCT approach and how we have a very decentralized um, agenda or operational system at UCT. And what we're seeing in this decentralized system is the rise of research units or academic departments functioning as think tanks with very particular agendas and particular disciplinary networks. And communication is at the center of this endeavor. Uh, for a lot of uh, these organizations and entities, they, they are employing full-time communications people to work in research uptake. Uh, they're often called content offices or research uptake offices. And again, this is coming from the imperative to often report to funders. But because in this model, there's the sense that unless you're evaluating how you are speaking to audiences and who those audiences are, you're not fully understanding your work. This is an example of the kinds of communication activities that think tanks and research units are increasingly engaged in. Um, you can look through the, the list in detail if you like, but I think it's useful because it gives you a sense of the broad spectrum of activity and detail in terms of the enterprise. So we can see there's a a new global focus on research uptake. Um, there are a lot of uh, new initiatives in terms of research to act in action. And uh, we have with us, Diana is at, at the back there from, from Drusa. Drusa is a, a big new project that is looking specifically at research uptake um, with a number of, of African partners. This is an, uh, what's also important about this, I think, in thinking about scholarly communication as well. These are, other than initiatives, these are whole new academic disciplines. 
So there's something interesting as well in terms of us making the space in universities where these academic disciplines can find a home. As I mentioned, new ways for us to think about impact. Uh, this slide comes from a presentation that was done by Cameron Nalen at UCT recently, where he was interested in following Twitter relationships and tracking the journey of content through publication into social media, through various networks, and then returning back to the researcher. Impact Story uh, is a, is a rapidly evolving space, uh, the total impact space. Um, this is a very, an example of a very easy tool to use. Uh, these kinds of tools can be used by individual academics, ordinary single people, or they can be used by uh, research units, think tanks, institutions who are interested in developing some sense of the story that their research uh, of the impact of their research. As we mentioned, the correlation between economic development and research uptake and, and openness, uh, we're seeing a lot of focus and activity in this area. This is probably the most cited example um, in the Human Genome Initiative where $3.8 billion of investment has, dr has driven $796 billion in return. So there is significant evidence being racked up in terms of economic and innovation argument, which as the open access space matures, takes the open access argument into government in a different way. And I think this is particularly important for us. Um, this is an example of the, the well-known Houghton study. So new modes of delivery also become really important for us in terms of thinking about new modes of scholarly communication and communicating with new audiences. This is an example from the Children's Institute based here at UCT, which is one of those think tank entities that I refer to. Uh, they have a radio project which they're using to reach children in communities. Uh, we work with the University of Mauritius, and radio is also a really powerful medium in Mauritius. Uh, our researchers speak to us a lot about community radio and how they appear on radio regularly. It's an important forum not to be forgotten about. And then, as was mentioned this morning, BMC's move into mobile delivery, also really significant. Um, one of the really interesting things about Africa is how we lag behind so often in many senses, but then how we also manage to leapfrog over a, a lot of the trials and tribulations that <coughs> maybe more developed nations have to endure. And I think the move to mobile has been one of those examples. Uh, we've actually bypassed a number of hurdles in terms of connectivity, in terms of moving to mobile, but still challenges exist in terms of thinking about communicating with people through the mobile space. And if you are one of those entities that is engaged in all of these activities of the kind that I mentioned in that list, mobile is an important new area to think about how easy is it and how efficient is it for people to access your content on mobile devices. I want to make another comment. Also, there's, there seems to be a, a lot of assumption about how ubiquitous smartphone usage is um, in Africa generally. From our personal experience, we were surprised to see um, in a number of the institutions where we've been that smartphone use is not, um, I would <coughs> venture to say, is not even commonplace, never mind ubiquitous. You notice it when you see it, which is how, how rare it can be. I want to say also something briefly about a new interface between teaching and learning. Uh, Laura spoke this morning about the open content directory. The open content directory started sharing OER and then because of need and a number of other factors went into sharing research. And one of the real challenges for us in the OER initiative is that we eventually ceased to be able to tell the difference between the research and the teaching content. 
there were resources that presented interesting challenge in this respect, and they were often the most popular resources. So we're seeing very interesting things happen in this nexus between research and teaching. We, this year, as part of our research, conducted a survey on research communication practices in our participating institutions. And at one of our institutions, 82% of respondents, when asked why do you conduct research, said to enhance and support their teaching activity. We were completely surprised by that finding. We had assumed a number of responses about because it makes me feel good or because my institution asks it. In fact, we had list, listed all of those as alternative responses. But still there's this overwhelmingly strong response in terms of teaching. And when I'm challenged on the question of why is Africa different and how are the challenges around scholarly communication different in Africa, we keep coming back to this issue of the, the load of teaching. Because when we speak about the load and the need to develop capacity in African institutions, so much of this seems to consistently come back to the systemic issue around the need for education and the need to support the teaching endeavor. So we also have new challenges, and, and there are many. Um, we need to build a new policy environment. This is a challenge for us because it requires engagement at national and institutional levels. We have to also address content management and curation systems for alternative forms of content. Most of the systems and processes as they are set up currently speak to the exchange of journal articles. Um, so I'm hoping that in this respect the work that we're doing might perhaps leapfrog over some of the issues that open access is having because I actually think in our drive to share multiple forms of content we're going into a very exciting open science, open knowledge space which isn't so narrow as simply a grappling between green and gold journal article exchange although we acknowledge that that's a key global issue. The issue of exploring new forms of quality assurance and peer review, I'm conscious they're, they're global, this is a global, of global interest. There's a lot of momentum going on around this at the moment. Um, but for us particularly, there's a great deal of anxiety in African institutions around quality in terms of sharing. So as part of our work, we've been interested in exploring in our pilot sites new forms of quality assurance and peer review that are not so arduous as to cripple the system again, but that can really give people peace of mind and at least facilitate moving into open sharing. Beyond that, there is the challenge of making publishers of entities that never previously conceived of themselves as publishers. So the idea of these think tanks and research units within universities, we're seeing those entities function as publishers. And that requires a strategic, cohesive approach. It requires resources. It requires making it somebody's job. I think there's a lot of interest at the moment, in t and there has been a lot of experimentation in terms of what can we expect from academics, Will academics deposit in repositories? Will they describe their content? Will they disseminate? They might, but we can't rely on them solely to do it because they've got other jobs to do. So one of the crux areas for us is the issue of investment and new resources to support capacity development and develop <coughs> spaces in the university from which this activity can be driven. That's it for me.